ESC Council for Basic Cardiovascular Sciences. I would like to welcome everyone uh, who joined us here today uh, for uh, our monthly webinar series for cardiovascular research discoveries. Uh, as you uh, um, well remember, these uh, seminars are organized in the way that we invite a, a very established investigator. And today we have a huge honor of hosting Professor Mauro Giacca uh, and uh, a person uh, who is uh, um, in sort of uh, really an up and coming, uh, very well publishing uh, young uh, investigator. And today uh, we would like to thank Christian Barr for uh, finding time and joining us uh, and uh, presenting uh, their work. We first uh, uh, invite both of our speakers to uh, make uh, brief presentations and then encourage all of the participants of the webinar to ask questions. Please type your questions in the question and answer uh, box and we will be sure to uh, uh, transfer and uh, read out these questions to our speakers. So uh, please engage with these uh, speakers because it's a unique opportunity uh, to uh, do so. And as you noted, the uh, main topic of uh, today's webinar is uh, RNA therapeutics. And uh, the first uh, lecture will be delivered by Professor Mauro Giacca, who is now a director of School of Cardiovascular Health and Medicine at uh, King's College London. Uh, and we all know that until 2019, he served as director general of uh, an uh, international center for genetic engineering and biotechnology in uh, uh, Italy, uh, uh, which is an organization based on the United Nations and uh, has contributed to the field enormously throughout the years. So Mauro, thank you very much for uh, uh, speaking to us uh, today and presenting uh, uh, your studies uh, based on various different achievements uh, and grants, including uh, uh, advanced investigator grants, uh, BHF grants, and uh, others. Mauro, thank you for finding time and welcome. Thank you very much, Tom, for, for um, having having me here. It's really my my great pleasure participating in, in in this series. So so basically, what what I would like to do in uh, <coughs> the in, in my time is to to elaborate a bit on the possibility of using uh, RNAs. Uh, for the heart with two main applications, so, so cardiac regeneration and, and, and cardiac uh, gene uh, editing. And uh, the, 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 the idea that uh, of these two applications stems from one very simple consideration, which dates back really to the, the 1800s, it is that uh, cardiomyocytes are post-mitotic cells. So you can take out these cells from an adult heart. They are these beautiful brick-shaped uh, uh, cells are hypertrophic because uh, since they don't divide, uh, the only way of increasing the heart size is to increase the cytoplasm. And these cells can be, you can do everything except uh, pushing these cells into replication. And, and the fact that uh, other cardiomyocytes don't proliferate has a, a few main consequences. The first one is obviously that there is no spontaneous cardiac uh, uh, regeneration and that uh, cardiomyocyte loss is, uh, is quite uh, irreversible. Consider that uh, today we have uh, several drugs that uh, uh, try to improve the cardiac function in, in heart failure, but we have no drug that protects from against cardiomyocyte loss, neither acutely after myocardial infarction or chronically, for example, doxorubicin treatment. And we don't have any treatment for cardiac regeneration. The second consequence of the post-mitotic state of cardiomyocytes is that they don't do spontaneously homologous recombination. So this means that if there is a double-strand DNA break, the only way that this can be repaired is through homologous, not homologous end joining, but not through homologous recombination, because homologous recombination requires proteins that are expressed during the S phase. I'm speaking of RAD51, RAD50, RAD MBS1, MRE11, MDC1. And these proteins are not expressed in post mitotic cells. And so basically the only way for repairing is a non-homologous enjoyment means that precise gene editing, so precise correction of genetic defects cannot, uh, cannot occur. So the idea of, uh, that we have of RNA therapy is a transient therapy to transiently modify the cellular environment. So have, suppose you have one of these uh, beautifully brick-shaped cells, and then transiently you deliver an RNA that changes uh, cell behavior 
then the RNA is degraded and the cell comes back as it was before. But in that period of time, it has performed some interesting action. The RNAs we are most interested in are non-coding uh, RNAs. These are the three categories of non-coding RNAs that can be considered for therapies. Antisense oligonucleotide pair with messenger RNAs and long non-coding RNAs. They have a DNA component uh, because the, their effect is maximized by RNAs H that binds to duplexes between RNA and DNA and degrade the uh, target. SRNAs and microRNAs are double-stranded uh, uh, RNAs. They require loading into risk and then they target the messenger RNA according to the extent of pairing. They can block translation or drive degradation. Aptamers instead have conformational RNAs that binds usually proteins but also small molecules and uh, they can subtract these molecules from their uh, function. Just to say that we are not speaking about uh, what will happen in the future, but we're speaking of the presence. This is uh, the current list of uh, products that have been already approved by the Food and Drug Administration and uh, uh, EMA and or EMA. And you see that this first part of the table are antisense oligonucleotides. The second part of the table are uh, short interfering RNAs. And what is interesting in this table is if you look at the last column where are the dates of approval, you see that uh, several of these uh, um, uh, 13 products have been approved very recently, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 18, 20, 21, 20. So it has been, this has been a field that has really boomed over the last years, and there are other 14 therapies for cardiovascular disorders that are in advanced phases of clinical experimentation. How can we find the uh, RNAs, the non small non-coding RNAs that are effective for our applications? So, so for example, in post-mitotic cardiomyocytes, we love screenings. Non-coding RNAs are small, and so they are very amenable to array library screenings and uh, screenings that can be performed in 96 or 384 well plates with a readout according to the phenotype that one desires that can be by high content microscopy. And there are libraries available for microRNAs, siRNAs, LNAs against uh, these uh, molecules or guide RNAs for CRISPR-Cas9. And uh, we love my microRNAs in particular because uh, there are many microRNAs, but there are not too many. There are probably a bit more than 2,000 microRNA in humans. All of these are, are known and they can be synthesized as synthetic mimics and the libraries can be simply purchased of synthetic mimics. Each microRNA is pleiotropic, so it targets tens or hundreds of different genes. It means that uh, they have been evolved by and evolution by nature to perform complex functions, so to change complex phenotypes. This is in contrast, for example, at inhibiting a single gene, a single link RNA or a single messenger uh, RNA. And, and then uh, being small, they can be directly administered as a therapeutic. Just to give an idea, this is the facility we have uh, here at the School of Cardiovascular Medicine at King's. And this is a list of the libraries. So there are libraries available for whole genome of siRNAs, for mouse and mice, for uh, 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 microRNAs, for mouse and mice, anti-microRNAs, and then libraries of guides against uh, all uh, human genes. We have used the screenings and then followed up on the effect on microRNAs uh, since the last uh, basically 10 years. We started with microRNAs that uh, induce a transiently cardiomyocyte uh, proliferation, ended up in a few microRNAs from a screening for proliferation in neonatal cardiomyocyte. And, and then in the context of AV vectors, we have shown that these microRNAs are able to regenerate the heart in both mice and pigs. More recently, we have performed a series of screenings for microRNAs that enhance homology direct repair. So the idea is here is to take a cardiomyocyte that doesn't do homologous recombination and push this cardiomyocyte transiently 
to perform homologous recombination and, uh, and, and then basically to push the cardiomyocyte after a Cas9 induced break to repair through homologous recombination using an exogenous template that uh, you had from the uh, outside. Uh, this is very important uh, for uh, cardiomyopathies. So this is a, an heterogeneous series of, uh, of uh, inherited conditions, several of which are very frequent. Hypertrophy cardiomyopathy has a frequency of one or 500 in the, in the population, and most of which have uh, an autosominal dominant or in, in inheritance, which means that the only way of targeting them uh, appropriately is not through gene transfer, which is also rendered difficult uh, by the fact that several of the involved genes are genes coding for protein of the sarcomere channels, which are very big, they don't fit into heavy vectors. But the appropriate way would be to directly correct the defect, but the precise correction of the defect that does not occur through a normal ozone journey it requires homologous recombination. And so we have to have cardiomyocyte performing homologous recombination. So we set up a screening in which we have a reporter, GFP, which is a uh, black because uh, it has a point mutation and we specifically correct this point mutation through homologous uh, uh, recombination and we screen a library of microRNA this is just to give you an idea of how the screening works uh, each uh, of these uh, are um, wells from uh, from the screening these are control microRNAs these are in, in red you see where we transfect the reporter GFP which is the, 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 the fluorescently dead and this is a microRNA that instead increases very significantly the extent of uh, correction. We found out of uh, over 2,000 microRNAs screened, 21 that increased significantly homologous directed uh, repair. And what was very interesting is that uh, 10 of these 21 have exactly the same seed sequence, which is one reported here. They belong to fam the families of microRNAs like 302 or 520. These are families of microRNAs that. Uh, are very highly expressed in embryonic stem cells and they're also used to maintain uh, em embryonic uh, stemness. So the fact that uh, we can recover 15 microRNAs, uh, 10 microRNAs out of 21 uh, uh, in the screening means uh, that they have the same seed, means that really we are targeting a common pathway that uh, pushes the cells to become uh, uh, to become um, proficient in homologous recombination. Uh, this is the way these microRNAs work in vivo with uh, AV vector. So uh, basically, here we are using three different AV vector: one coding for uh, the, the two of the microRNAs, another one for uh, a, a guide targeting a region in the myosin light chain uh, locus, and, and the third one with the homology template. These three microRNA, these three AV vectors are uh, used to uh, transduce the heart of a Cas9 mouse, uh, so a mouse that expresses Cas9 protein in cardiomyocytes. And you see that uh, we, we can uh, eventually find even in, in, in adulthood that uh, we can push with these microRNAs several of the cardiomyocytes to uh, perform homologous recombination. One of the problems obviously is how we deliver this. The AV vector can be used for this purpose because they are fantastic tools for gene transfer into the heart. The AV9 has an exquisite cardiac tropism in mice. AV6 works very well for cardiomyocytes in pigs. But the problem is that they keep expressing their transgene forever. You don't want that for a microRNA that drives proliferation and regeneration. And in fact, our peaks uh, injected with the 199A expressed from NAV vectors so regenerated their heart. But after two months, they started developing arrhythmias. They had overgrowth cells in the heart. You don't want a proper proliferative non-coding RNA to be expressed forever. And on the other hand, you don't want the Cas9 protein sticking around. And again, uh, having a, a, a gene editing working in, in the heart and in, in any other organs is much better accomplished if uh, the treatment is uh, very uh, transient. So the idea is to deliver these non-coding RNAs uh, uh, transiently. We can see what uh, uh, is uh, what are the modifications that are required or the carriers that are required on these non-coding RNAs in the approved the products as I showed you in the table before. 
So the, the most e efficient way for anti-stainless oligonucleotides is a gap mirror approach, in which basically you have two flanks which are um, a formed RNA, which is heavily modified, so two prime methoxyethyl modifications. So this is a very natural modification that permits uh, um, in, in, um, by, by which nucleases uh, don't work. And the core, as I mentioned already before, is formed instead of DNA, which permits pairing with the target um, uh, mRNA and recruitment of RNAs uh, age. If you instead want to simply to inhibit uh, uh, um, pre-mRNA splicing, so where you don't want to degrade the RNA itself, then uh, you can substitute completely all the uh, RNA nucleotides with uh, uh, heavily modified methoxyethyl to prime methoxyethyl uh, uh, nucleotides, or even change completely the chemistry and have uh, as a backbone uh, a, a steaming nucleic acid made by the morpholino chemistry. This is the case of nosinescence and golodicin, respectively, which are the two leading products uh, for uh, modulation of uh, uh, splicing of uh, spinal muscular atrophy or the shen uh, um, of the dystrophy in gene. If you go to, uh, the, there is no product based on my microRNA that has been already approved. SRNAs from the chemical point of view are identical. And of the SRNA that have been approved for a clinical experimentation, Inclisiran is uh, uh, relatively modified on the passenger strand, less on the guide strand. And it is coupled with a GALNAC moiety that permits after intravenous injection, this accumulation selected in the liver. So basically here you can use a naked, a naked molecule. Instead, uh, uh, patiziran is an uh, uh, SRNA against transtyretin. It also goes to the liver, but it needs to be delivered through a lipid nanoparticle. So basically you can inject uh, systemically and they persist uh, uh, antisensory nucleotides. You can inject systemically also my microRNAs probably and the sRNAs, but only if they are conjugated and only if you target the liver. Otherwise you have to use uh, carriers. And we have tried for our purposes, several trial carriers in the past. We have tried different polymers. We have tried uh, dendrimers. We tried carbon nanotubes. We have tried gold nanoparticles. Nothing works uh, well in the heart. What we found to work well are lipid nanoparticles formed using the uh, SNALP technology. This is the same technology that he used in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. So these SNALPs, are approximately 100 nanometers uh, particles that are formed by four lipids. The most relevant one is ionizable lipid. So it is a lipid here. You see a list of the lipids that are used, that, uh, that can be used. And this lipid is a basic uh, at uh, acidic pH. And, and so it binds to the negatively charged RNA. And then it becomes neutral if you raise the pH and it falls back and forms a sphere together with other three lipids, two of which are neutral helper lipids. One is usually cholesterol, and one is a phosphatidylcholine lipid. And then a lipid is pegylated to provide stability to the particle and to block the particle from being phagocytosed by the reticular endothelial uh, cells or the endothelial uh, system. And inside the lipid nanoparticle, there is the uh, uh, messenger RNA in the case of the vaccine, or in the case of patiziran, the sRNA against transtyretin, and this is the way we proceeded. Uh, this is, uh, these are SNALPs that we produce in the laboratory that contain the messenger RNA for GFP. These are treated on uh, cultured cardiomyocytes. The efficacy is really extraordinary, so more than 95% of cardiomyocytes are uh, transfected using this, uh, uh, this uh, method. And uh, we have also uh, produced a more elaborated version of uh, uh, these lipid nanoparticles, which have the same shell formed by the two hyperlipids and ions of lipid, and instead to compact the structure inside and to, to prevent an immediate release of the payload, we have uh, the microRNA, in this case it was the progenitive microRNA 1993P, coupled with two polymeric, uh, um, the two, two basic polymers, so PLGA and, uh, and poloxamer. And, and the, the shell in our case is formed by two 
uh, uh, ionizable lipids, a combination of dogma and, and, and DOTAP. This is the, the how we uh, the, the particles look like at the scanning electron microscopy. They have a bit more than 100 nanometers. And if you inject them in vivo in the heart, they persist uh, for more than uh, 10 days. And uh, you see, this is a quantification compared to the endogenous 199 level. And so basically, you have uh, over 100 fold uh, two days. Then it progressively goes down, but it takes more than 12 days to uh, reach basal levels. Uh, there are several ways uh, we can inject these uh, particles in, inside the heart uh, in, uh, that can be considered for clinical uh, application. For myocardial infarction, one can consider the uh, intracoronary route. It is known that the junction between dotelia cells in normal conditions don't allow passage of particles <coughs> Sorry, that are uh, bigger than 20 nanometers. AV vectors are borderline, they are approximately 20 nanometer, <coughs> nanometers in diameters. Uh, however, after myocardial infarction, there is a swelling of the endothelial cell junctions, forming fenestration of 400, 500 nanometers, through which this particle can uh, go through. And so uh, we are now testing these um, particles we, we produce over 100 nanometers to see if they, they transduce efficiently the heart cardiomyocytes after myocardial infarction. Uh, same consideration also apply to vascular perfusion. So the heart can be reached through the record retrograde delivery into the coronary sinus. And then there is the option of a direct intramyocardial injection. <coughs> Sorry, so injection into the skeleton, into the cardiac mass. This can be uh, obtained, for example, through a mini thoracotomy or uh, a, um, during bypass surgery, or in a, in a clinically more feasible way through um, transendocardial delivery with a catheter like the Helis catheter or the old or the old Myostar and Nova system fitted after electrophysiological mapping from the inside of the left ventricle. Obviously, this kind of application is interesting for regeneration because you can deliver the particles <coughs> directly in the infrared border zone. And uh, while it is more problematic if you have to transduce the whole heart as in an application um, for gene editing. So we fell really enthusiastically in love with the idea of developing a new generation of non-coding RNA therapies for uh, the heart, because uh, you can have a pipeline that goes from discovery through high throughput screening to clinical development and testing in small and large uh, animals. You stay away from uh, viral vectors. Ten years ago, I would never. I come from the gene therapy field. I've lived in the gene therapy field since. Uh, the early 90s, I would have never thought that uh, I would say <coughs> at a certain point that uh, I would want to stay away from viral vectors. Uh, but this is very exciting because they avoid all the problems of uh, AV vectors. And uh, the heart is a privileged organ because uh, if you inject systemically these particles, they go prevalently to the liver. But for the heart, you can do local administration through catheter-mediated delivery, which is a strong advantage in, in our case. And the manufacturing can uh, uh, be relatively straightforward as uh, <coughs> it can recapitulate that of the current developed uh, SRNAs and all the, all the vaccines. So many people involved in this, uh, in this work. This work started a few years ago in Trieste and continues still with the collaboration with my group in Trieste and then has evolved significantly in, 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 in London uh, recently. You have the name of the people here. I have a fantastic group both in London and, and in Trieste. And it's really a pleasure for me to go every, every day to the, to the laboratory and see the enthusiasm and the progress. And <clears throat> I'm very grateful to all of them. And I'm very grateful to you for your attention. Sorry for uh, my voice in these uh, difficult days. And, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mauro. And uh, we will take uh, questions. I would like to encourage everyone to post questions and question and answer uh, section. And I will, but uh, the, 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 the actual discussion will take place after the second talk. And I will uh, 
pass uh, now chair to uh, my co-chair, Professor Christian Weber. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce Christian Baer. I'm delighted to, to have him also as our more junior contributor to this session. So Christian obtained his PhD in genetics at the University of Leicester, then did a postdoc at the National Spanish Cancer Center in Madrid. So he has quite an international path that he's taken. And he's now a junior group research leader uh, at the Hannover Medical School, working on RNA therapeutics, enjoying quite significant funding from the EuroCVD network and also from our Transregio Collaborative Center here in, in Germany. And with that, producing seminal work on RNA therapeutics. And we look forward to your presentation, Christian. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Yeah, okay. So thanks again for the uh, nice introduction. Yeah, we will, I will um, shift a gear a little, I mean, from the micron aid to a um, somewhat different type of uh, non coding RNA. But uh, I mean, for the, the importance or the power that the non coding RNAs have, I think I do not need to convince you uh, anymore after uh, Maro's uh, beautiful uh, talk. So, they actually, in addition to the uh, micro RNAs that Maro introduced, there are also long non coding RNAs and uh, circular RNA uh, subtypes that uh, can influence uh, a large variety of uh, processes in the body and especially in the heart. And today, I just would like to focus on a, on a rather uh, recent uh, class of non-coding RNAs, the circular RNAs, and in the context of cardio-oncology. Uh, cardio-oncology um, is, is important, an emerging important uh, field uh, since with the development of really uh, potent uh, anti-cancer anti treatments. The uh, number of cancer survivors increases substantially, but this also leads to the emergence of many cases of chemotherapy induced uh, heart failure. And the problem is that these uh, often very potent anti cancer drugs are also very cardiotoxic, especially uh, the anthracyclines, but also uh, newer treatments uh, such as the CAR T cells for, for, for those also cardiotoxicity has been shown already. And so the aim is to find actually a balance between the oncologic uh, effect. And uh, thereby reducing also adverse effects on the on the heart. So just uh, let me give you a brief introduction on this rather new class of uh, circular RNAs. They are derived from uh, pre mRNAs or also pre uh, long non coding RNAs, if you want. And the, as you know, uh, they are transcribed as uh, precursors with uh, exon and intron structures, and then usually um, <coughs> spliced. So a regular mRNA is spliced in a linear fashion where exons uh, can be skipped to give a linear RNA. Uh, but in the in a recent year, one uh, recognized that there is also a process called uh, non canonical uh, back splicing. And this happens if a, a three prime uh, splicing donor. It's not uh, spliced to a five prime uh, uh, end uh, of a downstream, but rather to a, a upstream exon. And thereby, these uh, circular RNA structures can be formed. And uh, <clears throat> they can be formed in uh, several uh, forms from, from one uh, mRNA. Okay, and now it is, uh, um, it, be it became very clear that these are not just a splice artifact, but they, they are rather. Uh, real uh, functional circular RNAs. And they're also quite uh, interesting from, from the therapeutic uh, point of view because they are relatively stable as compared to linear RNAs. They are often uh, specifically expressed in certain cell types. And because they are derived from protein coding genes, they are also very conserved. And this makes uh, also preclinical uh, research and development uh, much easier. As uh, for example, compared to long non-coding RNAs, which are less well conserved. Okay, so um, we were interested in, in uh, identifying circular RNAs, uh, which are uh, involved in uh, cardiac disease. So we did a, a large uh, screening approach where we used uh, human heart failure samples and healthy samples, and uh, did a, a large-scale circular RNA um, 
uh, sequencing and cross this with sequencing data from mouse and those cell types and did a uh, lot of uh, in silico uh, filtering and ended up with four circ RNA candidates uh, or lead candidates um, of which this uh, novel candidate circ, uh, circ RNA derived from the insulin receptor was consistently found to be downregulated under doxorubicin stress in vitro, in murine cells, but also in IPS-derived cardiomyocytes, and also in vivo in a mouse model of uh, doxorubicin-induced cardiotoxicity, and importantly, also in uh, human heart uh, biopsies from patients that had developed um, uh, doxorubicin-induced heart failure. So then first, uh, we had to check if this uh, is uh, bona fide uh, circ RNA, and we did this by uh, sequencing the potential backsplice site, and indeed we uh, could detect it. And then we also uh, checked that uh, this uh, circle lacks a polyate, which is another feature of circular RNAs. And here we see that uh, while the uh, linear form of the insulin receptor uh, transcript has a is polyatailed, this is uh, not the case for the uh, circular form, which only enriches in the poly A negative fraction. And then if we uh, plot uh, de novo uh, transcription by actinomycin D, we also see that this uh, circ RNA is uh, um, more stable compared to the uh, linear transcript. <clears throat> and then to uh, functionally investigate it, we designed an siRNA against a circle. I mean, usually siRNA design is not a big deal. I'm just highlighting this because this is a special challenge for the uh, circ RNAs because you only have a very small uh, sequence stretch that you can um, uh, so around the backsplice site that you can design your siRNA against. Because if you would design it, for example, here, then you would also target the linear form. So we got lucky. We found a siRNA that works well, that can nicely uh, um, <clears throat> inhibit the circ RNA expression, but leaving the linear transcript unaffected. And um, we then, sorry. Uh, we then uh, perform, uh, inhibited the uh, circle and performed the uh, RNA seq. And as you can see, uh, uh, more than 1,000 genes were differentially uh, uh, regulated. And if we did a pathway analysis, we found <clears throat> pathways uh, related to uh, cardiomyopathy and uh, cell survival uh, significantly enriched. And then, because doxorubicin induces uh, cell death. We first checked in an uh, annexin uh, 5 assay, and there we see that the induction of uh, apoptotic cells by doxorubicin treatment was uh, even further increased upon silencing uh, the circle. And uh, in contrast, the cell vi viability also uh, already under basal conditions is uh, reduced if we inhi inhibit the circle and further reduced if we stress with doxorubicin. Then, Obviously, our next uh, step was to uh, overexpress the, the uh, circ RNA. And we did this first with uh, using an uh, AV virus. And here's also um, uh, where you have to pay attention when overexpressing circ RNA. You need in the overexpression uh, construct the uh, adjacent uh, elements. We use 500 uh, nucleotides um, upstream and downstream from your sequence. For us, it was quite easy because circ insulin receptor is a single. Uh, exon, uh, circ RNA, and these adjacent sequences contain uh, repetitive elements like the ALU or sign in the sign elements in human that help uh, the uh, formation of the circle. And then our con construct in vitro works uh, quite nicely. We see a, a dose dependent uh, increase of the uh, circ RNA in human cardiomyocytes. And then um, if we, in addition, challenge with uh, doxorubicin and check for apoptosis here in tunnel assay, again, we see as the expected increase in uh, tunnel positive cells, but this was uh, completely blocked if we treat with the circ insulin receptor. And uh, similar effects can be seen uh, um, in the context of uh, DNA damage by staining for the gamma H2AX. And because doxorubicin is also known to uh, affect mitochondrial function. We checked in the seahorse uh, mitostress uh, assay, the mitochondrial performance. And again, here's for the example of the spare respiratory uh, capacity. We see that this is decreased upon doxorubicin treatment, but at least partially rescued if we 
uh, overexpress this uh, insulin receptor circular RNA. And then an, an important question to answer uh, was what uh, you will uh, often get from collaborators or uh, reviewers is, is it really affected by the circular RNA or just by, by overexpressing this uh, linear uh, fragment? And as I said uh, before, that these uh, circularization elements or these other elements are very important for the formation. So we uh, simply uh, deleted them uh, and uh, saw that uh, indeed, if we remove these circularization elements, the circle uh, is not uh, formed anymore. And uh, then we check this again on a functional level. So we uh, 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 infected uh, human and red cardiomyocytes with the overexpression uh, constructs and the mutated one and treated with doxorubicin. And here we saw that we get this uh, speci uh, the protection specifically from the circularized form, but not if we overexpress the linear form. And uh, the same was seen in a cytotoxicity uh, assay where we find a rescue only with the circular form. And then to uh, further confirm this, and it's also to uh, address a point that uh, Mauro mentioned to you, such an RNA therapy you would rather have in a transient way, then uh, we also ask if we can produce the circle um, in vitro. So we did uh, in vitro transcription of the of, of this uh, ex linear exon and then circularized it by taking a DNA a splint and treating with T4 DNA ligase, uh, which gave us uh, in vitro produced uh, circular uh, circ in insulin receptor RNA. And then if we uh, check for the expression or stability, if we put it on the cells, you can uh, nicely see that the circularized uh, form is uh, stable where the non-circularized form is uh, rapidly uh, degraded. And then we could also uh, confirm that also our, uh, say, in vitro uh, circle um, uh, provides uh, cardio uh, protection. Here is a scene for the, if we treat uh, cardiomyocytes, first with the uh, uh, in vitro circle and then with doxorubicin, we see protect, protection. But uh, also if we do this in a therapeutic uh, setting where we treat first with doxorubicin, one day later with the uh, therapeutic in vitro RNA and then check for gamma HJX, we still see a, a clear protection from the uh, circularized mimics, but not from the uh, linear. And then uh, finally, we, uh, we wanted to see if we also see a, a color protection in, in vivo. And here we uh, went back to the AV approach where we injected mice with our circ insulin receptor construct and then treated them for five weeks with doxorubicin and then waited another week before we did a final echocardiography where you could uh, clearly see the uh, doxorubicin treatment uh, reduction in ejection fraction, which was completely rescued in the uh, therapy uh, group. And the same is paralleled by the um, cardiac dimensions. Uh, here the uh, uh, wall uh, signals in uh, systole. And uh, this is known, uh, or this was uh, ex expected because the doxorubicin uh, induces in uh, atrophy. Which was uh, which also seen in the WGA staining for cardiomyocyte size, and where we again see the uh, clear uh, rescue after circ insulin receptor treatment. And uh, finally, we uh, wanted to have a look into the uh, mechanism and first ask what regulates um, uh, circ insulin receptor formation. And we did it in, uh, in silico uh, prediction for splicing regulatory. Um, or splicing regulators and found that uh, especially uh, PRACA1 was predicted to uh, facilitate the uh, uh, splicing in this uh, region. And uh, indeed, what we found is if we look in doxorubicin treated mice, we found uh, also a reduction of uh, PRACA1 levels. And if we inhibited PRACA1 with specific siRNAs, we find indeed uh, that the levels of the CERC insulin receptor uh, decrease. And then we did another, um, say, kind of artificial experiment where we um, transduced um, cells with the CERC insulin receptor overexpression uh, construct. And at the same time, then 
uh, inhibited uh, PRCA1 with siRNA. And here again, we see uh, less circle formation. So uh, we can say that at least, uh, so the PRCA1 at least partially controls the level of uh, circ uh, insulin receptor. Then the last uh, slide, I'll show you some uh, downstream uh, um, uh, mechanistic experiments that we did. So we wanted to know uh, how uh, does circ insulin receptor do the trick? And so we performed the um, on a uh, pull down with a specific probe against this uh, backsplice side of the circle and a second probe which uh, targets a linear um, uh, on a and then did a differential expression analysis and here we identified uh, the mitochondrial uh, protein SSBP1 or single strand binding uh, protein 1 as a um, uh, most likely interactor of, of this which we then uh, validated in individual uh, pull-down experiments and also in uh, immunofish uh, analysis we could confirm co-localization of uh, SSPP1 and uh, CERC insulin receptor. And then we also checked on the functional level in this uh, mito say, um, mitochondrial membrane potential impairment uh, assay where we see that if we uh, uh, inhibit the CERC insulin receptor, we have more impairment, which is rescued by overexpression of the SSBP1 uh, protein. And conversely, we, we uh, knew that the CERC insulin receptor uh, overexpression can increase cell viability, but this now uh, is uh, nullified if we uh, additionally inhibit this SSBP1. So, uh, this leaves us uh, confident uh, to claim that uh, CERC insulin receptor cooperates with SSBP1 to exert the uh, cardio protection. How this um, works in detail, uh, we are currently uh, working on. So to summarize, circular RNAs, I, I hope I can convince you that circular RNAs play important roles in doxorubicin cardiotoxicity, and uh, especially CERC insulin receptor is a good target, which is highly uh, conserved on the sequence as well as on the functional uh, level. On the, in the therapeutic activation of this uh, circ insulin receptor, not only by AV, but also uh, by uh, in vitro transcribed circle can prevent doxorubicin cardiotoxicity, which is um, in the protective effect, which is most likely mediated through the interaction with SSPP1. And uh, with this, I just want to thank all the people that uh, contributed to this exciting uh, project is our uh, whole uh, team of the IMTTS, which is uh, led by uh, Thomas Toom. And a, a special uh, mention for uh, Dong Chao Lu, who did his PhD in our lab, is now a postdoc, and he did uh, most of this work. And of course, I want to thank our uh, collaborators for uh, providing the uh, human samples and our collaborators in, the, in Munich and Frankfurt for their uh, input into the uh, project. And uh, of course, for all, all the uh, funding agencies and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christian. You, yeah, you already unshared. So yeah, those were two beautiful and, and complimentary talks. And, um, we may just enter into the into discussion and, and and Tom, you might also look into the, the questions that we've received. I, I may just start with, with Christian. Um, there's a question from Fabio Martelli uh, asking how efficient the circularization of the overexpressed uh, 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 in R is. Uh, is there also a linear counterpart that is overexpressed? Yeah, this is, uh, thank you, this is a really excellent uh, question and um, also a very relevant question. I cannot uh, give you precise uh, numbers, but uh, certainly if we overexpress it, the circle formation is um, probably relatively inefficient. So you would get much more of the linear form than the circularized uh, form. And that's why it is uh, important to do the experiment, uh, which I showed, then to answer, is it the, the circle uh, which does the trick or is it the uh, linear one? And uh, 
which is nice and which I think is the way to go in the future is with the in vivo, uh, in vitro transcribed uh, produced uh, circle. We could then, for example, with the nanoparticle that uh, uh, Mauro mentioned, bring them to the heart because then there you can uh, get rid of, of all the uh, linear um, uh, RNA and specifically deliver the circle. But um, in vivo using the AV, AV approach is certainly quite and uh, uh, inefficient circuit commission. Yeah, th th thank you very much. May maybe also a question from, from my end. Uh, so we, we know from the microRNAs that RNA binding proteins can also affect localization and uh, also canonical versus non-canonical function uh, as to, to cleavage, for instance. So do you know anything more about the downstream mechanism by the interaction with the single strand uh, binding uh, protein one? So does it affect localization of your CERC RNA or possibly also, yeah, functionality? Uh, this, we, um, we, we, don't, we don't know it uh, yet, but I mean, this is uh, what we're looking into now. If, if the, the circuit, for example, can uh, maybe involve into the uh, mitochondrial uh, shuttling or localization of this SSBP1. Um, but we, we, yeah, I cannot uh, give you details uh, simply because we don't know. What we, what we know is that the SSPP1 is stabilizing mitochondrial DNA. And for this function, it also needs the, the circle is also needed. Yeah. But um, yeah. Very nice. And I think in most of uh, people asking questions are starting by really praising both of these presentations and uh, their novelty and, uh, and strength. Uh, but uh, Mauro, uh, uh, the two questions that are linked to each other uh, are related to firstly, the cells that are uptaking the content of the particles. Uh, have you identified, looked very carefully, uh, which cells are, are actually the target cells? And related to that, and maybe even more important, is what are the future ways of delivering RNA to cardiac myocytes? Because this is a, a difficult uh, cell to, 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 to target, I think. And uh, could you comment, where do you see the future of, uh, uh, of, of targeting cardiac myocytes? Uh, in terms of cells that, that uh, uptake uh, lipid nanoparticles, it is both uh, cardiac myocytes and fibroblasts, so much less endothelial cells, which is another story that, that's very interesting. So I think that there is not a single way of transferring gene efficiently to endothelial cells that is known, either viral or non-viral. And, uh, but uh, you can modulate uh, the lipid composition, in particular, the lipid ratio and type of ionized lipid and have these particles going better to cardiomyocytes or to fibroblasts. As you say, the holy grail is, is doing targeting. So, so basically having a sort of uh, a, a, a medicine that you can inject systemically and ends up in cardiomyocytes. And here, if you look in the literature, there have been a really huge number of attempts at finding uh, targeting peptides, antibodies, uh, and, and, and other ways of targeting cardiomyocytes. We are testing some, uh, some of them. Uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, from, from the experiment we have so far, we can say that, uh, say, if you inject a lipid nanoparticle, 95% goes to the liver. If you inject a targeted lipid nanoparticle, uh, then uh, it increases uh, cardiomyocytes uptake tenfold. But instead of 95%, 90% goes to the liver. So you, you don't solve the problem. Uh, 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 significantly. And, and I think that part of the problem is related to the fact that we don't have a receptor, in, not even to identify cardiomyocytes. So, so we are still stuck on the lack of a, a membrane receptor that is specific for cardiomyocytes for ident even identification of cardiomyocytes, so even more for uh, the, the, the developing targeting, targeting uh, uh, ways. And Simonetta Ossoni is asking something very related. Is, uh, are hypertrophic cardiac myocytes differently uptaking? Can you modulate that somehow to, uh, you know, to, is there a difference between healthy and, uh, and hypertrophic cardiac myocytes? We've never tried, but that's an, an excellent uh, idea. So, for example, delivering, uh, delivering nanoparticles uh, after TAC and see if there is a preferential uptake. Yeah, it, it would make a lot of sense that there is a difference, but we never tried that. So it's a very good idea. 
Thank you. I Maybe also that. related to that, uh, there's a question that there's also a very small fraction of cardiomyocytes that can re-enter the cell cycle. So is there any caveat to the use of non-coding RNAs with that? I mean, you, you mentioned also the, the, the duration of the treatment in, in, in uh, terms of you know, potential proliferation, um, but is there a specific caveat uh, towards that? Yeah, I, I think that is more a problem of, of a payload than, than the, the, the delivery method. Yeah. So, so basically, when, when we use our pro-proliferative microRNA, we see that, that the fractional cardiomyocyte uh, respond by many others not. And um, what is the nature of these cardiomyocytes responding? We don't know. We are doing now single cell, single nuclei experiment, uh, sequencing experiment to identify the, which are the cells, uh, which are the cardiomyocytes, if they have a different transcriptional signature, so we can identify them, uh, them, uh, them somehow. If you look at the single sequencing data from, uh, for example, neonatal mice uh, that, that have been produced by the Olson laboratory and, and others, uh, there is a, a, a specific signature in proliferating cardiomyocytes uh, that sets them apart from the rest, the rest of cardiomyocytes, even in uh, spontaneous conditions in the neonate. So it might well be that uh, there is a sub uh, subpopulation, but I, I don't think that anybody knows at this moment what's the nature of this sub subpopulation. Uh, and, and, and you mentioned other sort of cells in the microcirculation and the cilia and smooth muscle cells are not affected, right? Because that, that was also... No, I mean, the endothelial cells are, to, to me, are, are, are a big mystery because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, despite one can uh, generate uh, uh, targeted even AV vectors that, uh, that go to uh, endothelial cells, <clears throat> still uh, they enter these cells, but they are not functional. So they are blocked at the step uh, before uncoating or before single strand to double strand conversion. And so, bottom line, <clears throat> we, we don't have anything that works in endothelial cells in terms of, 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 of gene traps. The <clears throat> these cells have something peculiar. And then uh, the uh, one idea is that this, some spe this specific nature of these cells relates to the fact that these are related to the mechanism of endocytosis, which must be different. These cells are lining the vessels. They continuously have the opportunity of endocytosis, everything that circulates. And, and so they must have a sort of barrier or different type of endocytosis that block the cells to being overloaded. And I think that this reflects to both AVs and, and um, lipid-mediated delivery, which both go through endocytosis. But this is just an idea. Thanks. Uh, I think Pascale has been waiting very long with this question. Yeah. yeah, I wish to congratulate both of the speakers for the excellent talk. And I have two questions for, for Mauro and also Christian, very related to what we have already discussed. The first one is why, Mauro, in your hands, none of the other nanoparticles, nanocarriers that experimentally are normally very effective, like, for example, gold nanoparticles, are working. And the second question is, what about in terms of liposome, the effect on myeloid cells, and, uh, and so the indirect effect on cardiomyocytes through immune cells? Oof, I mean, I, I don't know why they work. I think, <clears throat> I think that uh, um, <clears throat> there is a huge difference from uh, testing efficiency in vitro and, and then testing efficiency in, 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 in vivo in the heart. We have, not, we have found nothing so far. And we've tested really many, many dif different carriers. Nothing that works better than, uh, than lipids for the, for, uh, for, uh, for the heart. Um, the other question is, uh, what could be the relative contribution of uh, 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 macrophages or monocytes that could uh, uptake uh, particles and then uh, uh, affect the, the, the cardiac function. Well, the, the, this is obviously a possibility. I have to say, however, that if you do <clears throat> in situ hybridization, for example, for microRNAs, then you see them uh, in, in cardiomyocytes. So certainly they go to cardiomyocytes. And, uh, but the, the fact that they can go also to other cells I mean, uh, is a, is a, can, can happen, I think. 
A question, thank you. A question posed uh, to Christian by John Baker is uh, how long the circular RNAs remain active after administration in animals? Um, yeah, so, so in, in, in our case, since we use the uh, viral approach, um, they will remain active because they are produced all the time in new, uh, especially in the cardiomyocytes, they do not divide, so you don't get a dilution effect from the episomal uh, AVs. So what, what um, the, I mean, the longest uh, time that we saw is uh, eight weeks, is at the end, uh, so eight weeks after administration, which is the experimental endpoint of our chronic cardiotoxicity model. And there it was still uh, fivefold uh, overexpressed uh, in whole heart tissue. So in the cardiomyocyte, in the individual cardiomyocyte, probably a bit more. The, but it's a very interesting question because it will be interesting to see if we use the, the um, in vitro transcribed circle and then we have um, some uh, lipid nanoparticle which would deliver them to the cardiomyocytes, how, how long it is uh, then uh, expressed as a, if you only deliver the circle directly. I guess it would be probably somewhere in the range of a, a couple of days. But this, if, I, if, if I may, just uh, to add to, um, uh, to, to the previous question tomorrow, I think one uh, ideal scenario would be if we find something on the surface of cardiomyocytes, like a specific uh, cardiomyocyte surface marker, which could be exploited uh, for delivery. But um, I think many people have uh, looked for it. And so far, yeah, there's uh, nothing really, or at least that I know of. I think there are so many interesting questions in this field that it's very exciting. For me, the question on endothelial cells is, is really intriguing. Uh, I can see AJ has uh, his uh, hand right. raised, and then maybe so, we have time of cut. I have a couple of questions for Mauro, um, one for Kitchen. And Mauro, have you, you, you showed that uh, you could promote HDR upper expression of your microRNAs. The question to you is, do they really promote HDR directly or suppress non-homologous end joining and the outcome is increased HDR? And if so, how much efficiency do you really get? What percentage of your genes get it targeted that way and get corrected through HDR? And also, in addition to that, really, can you see it in my site that's happening? Especially uh, my sites are in, in the not stimulated are in the G1 phase or G0 phase or not entered S phase. How are you going to get HDR there? Yeah, very good question. I, 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 was, I was very quick on that because I wanted to focus more on the, the, the delivery and the, the non-coding RNAs and uh, as a concept. Uh, so, uh, second question first, uh, um, why, why we know that uh, um, uh, it is a, a cardiac, so, sorry, first question, uh, I mean, uh, why we know it is non-homologous and joint suppression, simply because we have a system uh, in parallel to where we screen for microRNAs for non-homologous and joining. And, and these uh, microRNA here are completely neutral for models and joining. So they don't have an effect uh, at all, neither positive nor negative. Second, we know that the mechanism by which they work, they increase uh, uh, components of the non-homologous machinery. So you find uh, increased MR11, uh, RAD50, you can find increased uh, RAD51, which is the main single strand binding protein in, in involved in strand in invasion. And, uh, and, uh, and what is interesting in myocytes, they increase the levels of expression of cohesins, which are the proteins that keep during meiosis the two strands of uh, the uh, two recombinogenic chromosomes, the chromosomes that they combine together. So the, the concept is exactly the, 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 the one you were objecting to, that is, how is it possible that uh, post mitotic cells do homologous recombination? Because the, cardio, the microRNA increases the levels of the machinery. The, 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 that's his duty. Is this uh, related to proliferation? No, because if we take 199A as a microRNA, which is our best pro proliferative microRNA, and we use it uh, in an essay where we test for homologous recombination, does nothing. So 
we believe that it is just acting on the levels of the machinery. And what percentage efficiency? Of oh, your... it is. I mean, uh, I, I speak of this uh, in an enthusiastic manner because this is the first time I see really high levels of, of molecules of recombination in, uh, in an adult heart. But we are always speaking about in the order of 10%. So the, 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 it, it is not that the whole heart becomes, uh, becomes corrected. So we are still far from uh, a, a gene editing application in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, for therapeutic purposes. But still, I mean, this is the first, the first interesting step. Well, thank you. Question to Kitchen is, uh... The circular RNAs, how do you validate that besides bioinformatics tool? And second, they are typically expressed at exceedingly low levels in normal conditions. And do you think overexpression of it potentially could give you fortuitous effects, although you looked at the desirable part of it, and really what you see is not biologically as much relevant for therapeutic may be very applicable, that's fine, uh, but uh, it may not be what exactly is happening in biology. I mean, there's uh, like few, so, several interesting uh, questions. So, so, so we identify them uh, uh, bioinformatics, uh, that's, uh, that's right, but we always, and, and there, uh, usually we do uh, we have some filtering where we do like a healthy versus some disease co um, condition and one filter step is that we um, first filter out all the ones uh, which we would not be confident to validate in qpcr so the expression levels are too low and then uh, we de design a specific um, primers um, they're called divergent primers, so they are outward facing. If you would amplify the linear one, but then if if the if if you have the circle, then they would face uh, each other, and then you get a specific uh, amplification over the back spread side, which we um, then uh, validate in Sanger sequencing, and then we uh, also do um, RNA-R digest, which is a exo uh, nuclease. And if we have a real circle, that should be um, resistant towards the exonucleotic digest compared to the uh, linear one. And then for the yeah for the therapeutic effect, with if you overexpress, um, I mean I have to uh, I have to be honest. This was also one of the earlier questions. I guess the circularization is fairly uh, inefficient in a cell. I guess so. You never uh, get like these. Um, I don't know what you sometimes see with the AV, like 20,000 fold uh, overexpression of your um, RNA. So maybe this also uh, comes in uh, handy, but yeah, certainly few things to consider there. So do you don't see any uh, fortuitous effects other than specific targets that you identified? Well, so far. Uh, not for the circuit insulin receptor. All it good certainly there. is expected to bind to several other non-targeted proteins. Yeah. Um, well, we have we do not yeah. have data on this, and yeah, not not um, specifically looked. If we overexpress it, then we then we get then like uh, off-target binding to other proteins. I I don't know. Have we don't have the data for this. Thank you very much. But, but thank very, you very, much very, very thank good. You both you. Excellent presentations. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, Christian. Uh, there is also one more question from Khalid Montoui, and then maybe you can uh, summarize. Uh, and this is uh, mainly related to uh, whether any of you, um, Dr. Jaka or, uh, or Christian, uh, looked at the uh, angiogenesis in, in the models that, uh, that were studied. Of course, we already heard about the endothelial cell difficulty and so on, but uh, can you briefly comment? So I'm, I'm, see, I'm, I'm seeing that he's asking uh, uh, about uh, modify the mRNA, uh, make the mRNA from Lee or Zanji. This yeah, so this was the first, and then he asked about angiogenesis, but, but you know, the modified RNA is also interesting from Lee or Zanji, that's true, but uh, you already addressed the, the, the cell delivery as well, so please. Yeah, yeah. 
So the coronary microcirculation. Well, uh, the coronary microcirculation. Uh, I mean, uh, in the, 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 if you have cardiac regeneration, then uh, you, you also increase in angiogenesis in the regenerating area. So we don't see a discrepancy between number of endothelial cells and number of cardiomyocytes. My, in, in contrast with what <laughs> people in the endothelial field believe that uh, uh, endothelial cells drive regeneration, I think that. Uh, uh, angiogenesis uh, follows myocardial proliferation, but obviously I have a biased uh, point of view on that. Well, then thank you very much. So I'm you know, about to, to wrap up also on behalf of uh, Tom now, and I think uh, these were two wonderful, inspiring talks and a very thorough discussion, I have to say, and that, that perfectly illustrates, I think, the the value and the virtue of this cardiovascular discovery seminar that you can really move into the, the cutting edge this time of RNA therapeutics and really uh, elaborate uh, on that on a really unusually deep level. And so thank you very much. And uh, also uh, Tom and, and Sarah, I think we will keep you updated on the, on the program to come. So please stay tuned and uh, look forward to some, some more exciting uh, program in the future. And please remember uh, on behalf of all of us to uh, join uh, the FCVB uh, in Budapest. That is uh, the uh, frontiers of biomedical sciences that is taking place uh, at the beginning, end of uh, April and beginning of May. Absolutely. Thank you for pointing out. Thank and you. I would like to point out always publishing cardiovascular research. It's worth exactly. it. <laughs> I think this way it's, it's, it's much more reliable. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot.